Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Everyone hear me okay? All right, let's talk about some chaos. <laughs> um, but thank you, and all the people that you mentioned, thank you everybody um, for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of the Science on Screen series. I'm also really excited to be doing um, this movie in particular because I saw it a long time ago and it gave me an excuse to rewatch it again, and I really like this movie in general. So I'd hate to be doing one that I, I guess, hated, but <laughs> so I'm glad I'm doing this movie. Um, Okay, so I know a lot of you guys have probably already seen this film, but just to kind of go over, rehash what the motivation is, basically, Lola, if you haven't seen this movie, you might have guessed that it's the woman with the red hair. Um, she gets a frantic phone call from her boyfriend, Manny, which is right here. And basically, the, the idea or the premise behind this film is that she has to help him. He basically, he's a... He's a petty criminal who's not very good at his job, so he loses 100,000 Deutschmarks, and she has to help him retrieve 100,000 Deutschmarks in a certain amount of time um, in order to get it back to him so he doesn't get killed by the drug lord he's working for. Okay, so the rest of the film goes on to have three separate different runs or scenarios, and each scenario is gonna be the same amount of time, but they start seemingly almost the same, but with very, very slight differences that spiral into majorly different consequences for not only the major characters like Lola and Manny, but also the characters that they run into. So this captures the idea behind uh, the butterfly effect and chaos theory. So the idea behind that is basically, well, the, the chaos theory is just a branch of mathematics that deals with complex systems um, that basically their behavior is very, very sensitive to slight changes in conditions. So that something seemingly like insignificant or minor early on has major, major consequences later on. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a little bit the, the origin of it. It's pretty interesting history. So um, Dr. Edward Lorenz was working at MIT in 1960 and he developed this model. And he was a computer model that did, ran a simulation of weather. And he would do different input values, something that correlated maybe to like temperature, atmospheric pressure, um, humidity, wind velocity, things like that, and out would spit this long-term weather forecast. Everyone thought it was great. Everyone thought it was a big hit. Okay, we can forecast the weather for an infinite amount of, you know, like a very, very long amount of time. Um, until one day, he took some values from the middle of his simulation and inputted it back into the simulation and then he went and got coffee. So he let the simulation run. He goes, I just want to let a simulation run for a very long time. And so when he came back, he thought that the simulation would run the same as it had before, but just be longer. But he got something wildly different. Um, I'm gonna show you a plot. You might guess that it's not the actual plot that he got, but it depicts, it, it depicts um, a little bit of what he saw. So, the green line would be a simulation that he ran previously. The red line starts with his initial values that he got from the first run. So what happened? If you just spit out values anywhere along here, it should have basically followed the same path, which it does for a little while, but then it quickly diverges into a whole nother path. So what happened? Well, the computer stores and uses, um, for his particular simulation in 1960, it used value, uh, used numbers that had six decimal places. Um, but it spit, it, it spit out values that had three decimal places. So a number like 6.75432 just becomes 6.785. Uh, and it did this for no other reason than to just save paper. And it's pretty okay because rounding to, you know, the third decimal place is not that far, of, you know, a difference between these two values. And that's the issue here is that we're not, you know, deviating so much in the beginning but you have majorly different outcomes here. And what he understood from this is that it was so sensitive to this slight change in condition that basically a system, a complex system like weather prediction could never actually fully be forecasted for an extended amount of times. So basically, um, 
That's why, you know, uh, people who try to forecast the weather for an extended amount of time, it, it, it gets hilariously inaccurate when you're trying to do that. We always make fun of weathermen and things like that. But there's a reason for that. It's a complex system, and it's very, very sensitive to, you know, slight changes and in input values. And I mean, just this, this value alone being changed to that decimal place generated um, a wildly different, you know, outcome. So he went on, and he took this talk in 1972. He presented a talk called Predictability. Does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? During this talk, he did not talk about butterflies or tornadoes, but he basically talked about the differences um, that he saw when he used different approximations in his simulations and just the sensitivities to his sim simulations to these kind of approximations. Um, later, James Gleck released a book called Chaos, and he basically coined the term the butterfly effect. And the butterfly effect was used for basically anything that had seemingly small and unrelated effects that generated massive impacts. And this then leaked over into um, other fields, other, um, other fields like physics and chemistry and biology and even the social sciences. Some of the examples are in biology where we saw population growth where they noticed that at certain growth rates they saw chaotic behavior. In astronomy, when they're trying to model different multi-body systems, or even better asteroid predictions, how close an asteroid's gonna come to Earth, how close it's gonna come to another system, um, it worked better when they thought or incorporated um, chaos theory. And then even psychology, uh, group dynamics, when groups come together, how they work together, how they can produce new technologies and new ideas. All these things um, basically made more sense and were better able to be modeled once you incorporated chaos theory into them. So I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into how systems become chaotic. So let's take the population growth and dynamic behavior of our Canadian lynx here, because they're cute. Um, and this, <laughs> let's say it's represented by um, an equation. So it's a simple equation like this, where X represents the population at any given time, and R represents the growth rate. So growth rate on top, we're gonna to vary the growth rate, and we're gonna keep our initial population the same. So we're gonna have the same starting number, and this just represents the number of times that I'm running the equation, or iterations. So I'm gonna use that number, once it spits out, I use the next number as the input value. So things you can start to notice is that for a couple of values, so these low values over here, oh, um, zero means extinct, and one means the ma maximum population. So the numbers will only vary between those two limits. But basically, these two numbers, they start to get smaller and smaller. So they follow a trend, which makes sense. Uh, 1.5 seems to stabilize on a single value. 2.0 just spits out the same number. And then you start to go over to these higher growth rates, you start to see other trends emerge. So it starts to spit out one number periodically and then another number periodically. So by changing the growth rate slightly, you're starting to see wildly different outcomes. Um, say for 3.5, but instead of two numbers, it actually starts to stabilize between four different values here. So what this looks like on a chart is basically something that wasn't easily predictable. You have population here, both going to zero. You have a stabilizing number here. And then in this line chart, you can see that it fluctuates between the different values, the four values for the 3.5 and the two values for the 3.0. So, okay, so this shows a little bit of difference between the growth rates. So let's do something bigger. Let's take hundreds and hundreds of values and let's run it uh, iterations. So not hundreds of values, sorry, hundreds of iterations. And let's just plot the last hundreds of iterations and see what we get. So when we do that, we get a really cool bifurcation diagram um, over here. And what this basically symbolizes is the last number that it spit out. So if it stabilizes, you get one value. So over here, between zero and one, our growth rate before, it stabilizes at zero. This essentially means that our guys become extinct. Um, over here, it stabilizes at another value. It's basically two, so that means you have two parents, you produce two kids, your population's stable. Then that weird thing happens where you start to fluctuate between the different stable numbers. So here was four different values. And then when you expand the graph, so remember what it looks like, it basically offshoots like here, and then you have another values that offshoot, and then four that come from there. We expand it over here, and you can see how quickly we go from a single value to something that seems a lot more chaotic. 
So each of these values over here, if you look into this region, it's 100 different values. So what's happening? I'm just changing this slightly over here. And what's even more interesting is that within, whoops, within this area where it seems to be more and more chaotic, there's actually regions where it stabilizes again. So here, within these little areas that looks blank, it actually stabilizes between three values again and then goes to a value that's chaotic. So the difference between 3.85 and maybe 3.852 goes from something stable to something chaotic. Another really interesting thing is that you start to notice um, basically different things called fractals. And what they are is it a pattern that repeats at every level. So the deeper and deeper I go, the more and more I expand, I'll start to see these same things occurring. So you look at a system and you might think, oh, it's completely chaotic, I can't model, there's nothing we can do about it, but you can actually start to see patterns emerge. And if you look up, I didn't include any pictures here, but fractals are super interesting and they're really, really pretty. Um, anything from like mold to crystals, to uh, different kinds of vegetation. Basically, the more and more you zoom in, the same kind of patterns appear. It's really, really interesting. But I'm not here to talk about that all day. Um, basically, the next step he did was he wanted to say, OK, chaos is chaotic, but it's not random. Right? There's going to be a cycle, basically like a method to the madness. Um, so he had these different <laughs> equations. And he plotted the solutions to the equations with varying initial conditions. And he saw that even though the solutions never overlapped each other, they basically kind of circled around two different areas. And he called these two different areas strange attractors. Um, but he basically made the notion that you can, there is a cycle to it. Um, and basically, the cycle looks very pretty. So even though the two trajectories never really cross each other, there's still a cycle to it. So there is an element that is predictable. And also, if you take these two oval patterns, you notice that, and you turn it at a slightly different angle, it looks like a butterfly. So <laughs> there's that. But it, this basically, I like, I like this. I found this representation online. I didn't invent this, but like this idea is essentially like if you had a town full of a certain amount of people and you have like 10,000 people in a town and you have one grocery store, so you have one Wegmans and everyone is completely satisfied with it. Then another company moves in and you have more people, so now they can build another supermarket. But then some people leave because they grow up, they go to college or there, you know, something else happens or another company shuts down and they leave. So it fluctuates in population, which fluctuates the growth or the closing or the opening of that business, that supermarket. So you essentially fluctuate between two different solutions, but you never really stabilize in one. So this is just a depiction of a chaotic system. Uh, but the chaotic phenomena can vary, but only within limits. So that's basically the moral of the story. It's like it's very sensitive to initial condition. It is a chaotic system, but it varies within limits that can be modeled. A really fun actual physical system that shows chaotic behavior is um, a double pendulum. So it's, a set, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a single pendulum with another pendulum attached to the end of it. And when you start it off, you basically swing it up and you just drop it at different angles. You'll notice very, very different behaviors with the slightest change in degree angle that you started the path from. So I have this little GIF here. So you can see on the top the different in angle, so 0 and the 0 0.1. And you can see basically the tracer that's on the second pendulum here, N, is a way different trajectory than the first one. And it gets more and more chaotic the higher you lift it. And people do this a lot on YouTube, is they like to attach lights to the end of it and do it. So these were basically two different, just slightly different angles. But you can see the path is completely different from each other here. It's a fun one to do. And this is actually, if you go to my physics lab, you could click on that and you can do it yourself. And you can change the model for the different parameters and things like that. It's fun. Um, but so yeah, so that's basically you know, chaos theory and the butterfly effect. So let's talk a little bit about what it has to do with Run Lola Run. So in Run Lola Run, we see the characters go through minor differences in the actions with very, very different consequences for both Lola and people that she runs into, as well as Manny and people that he runs into. 
So some of the things to look for, I kind of picked out my favorite things. Um, even though I saw this movie before and then I watched it again, there was still stuff that I picked up. And that's what I like about this movie is that there's always going to be stuff that you can pick up. So three runs, like I told you before, same amount of time per run. Um, run one, she meets the man and the dog at the top of the stairs right after she gets that phone call and she starts running. And it's in this cartoon sequence. But the dog growls and she runs faster. So you can start to see the, the changes in initial conditions. So dog growls, she runs faster. Then she meets, and I think the most, one of the most interesting characters in Run Lola Run is the woman with the baby carriage. Then she meets the woman with the baby carriage. She bumps into this woman. All of a sudden, you see this flash forward. And this woman now is, uh, her and her husband are alcoholics. They lose custody of the kid. I mean, like, it's, it just spirals out of control from, for her. Um, then she encounters a man riding the bike. He offers to sell it to her, and she, refuse, she refuses. He later becomes married. Um, and in this scenario, she causes a car accident. In run two, so the same kind of people that she encounters, the man and the dog, she actually falls and injured her legs, with major, with, which makes her limp, which now causes a time delay for the rest of the run. Um, in this second one meeting with the woman with the baby carriage, she actually brushes her lightly. So she still touches her, but just brushes her lightly. This woman has major success later, later on. Um, bike man, she runs, she accuses him of stealing the bike. Um, later, consequences from him don't really work out that well. In this run, she causes another car accident. Uh, what I really like about this movie, and the reason I'm reading these off, is something I wanted to point out is that they don't vary that much in the beginning. They actually start off very similar, and like with the woman with the baby carriage, bumping into her and brushing her slightly isn't totally different, but it causes a totally different end effect in, in those two people's lives. Um, then in run three, she completely leaps over the dog. Uh, the woman avoids, bike she misses, um, and in this one, not so much car accident. Um, other interactions you should look out for is when she goes to the bank to meet her father, um, her timing seemingly allows for various scenarios to play out, wildly different from each other. Also, the security guard at the bank, um, her interaction with an ambulance, and also um, there's a minor interaction where Manny interacts with a woman trying to get a phone call. Um, we basically see the chaos theory, butterfly effect, and the slightly different initial conditions producing these wildly different outcomes for all the characters in this movie. So if you want more chaos, <laughs> there's a lot of, this is probably, you know, the main thing, um, the main place where people have heard it. Basically, uh, mathematician, I almost said mathematician Jeff Goldblum, but probably, <laughs> uh, predicts the downfall of the park through chaos theory. Um, also in Blind Chance, I didn't know about this movie until I started researching other movies like this, but Blind Chance is, um, is a film where a young man is running after a train and it goes off whether or not he catches the train, what, you know, what happens after. Um, is depending upon whether it catches the train. It goes through three different scenarios, just like Run, Lola, Run. So it's very, very similar. Um, also, I mean, I had to include the butterfly effect, obviously, but uh, other movies that where you have basically, like in Dying Darko, you have the multiple timelines with different events that influence and disrupt each other. Um, same idea with the butterfly effect. And then uh, for literature, we have A Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury where he discusses how the death of a butterfly in the past um, could have drastic changes in the future, um, then goes on to discuss the physics of time travel. And then also in the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, he basically um, plays with the idea of indefinitely predicting the, uh, predicting the laws of nature. Sorry, indefinitely predicting the future through the laws of nature. And I just want to end with a quote by Dr. Lorenz. Um, basically, if the flap of a butterfly's wings can be instrumental in generating a tornado, um, it could be equally well instrumental in preventing a tornado. So don't blame butterflies for everything. <laughs> so that's about it for me. Um, enjoy the film. Thank you.